on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. The property management thing just didn't work because I couldn't put the effort into it. And I was trying to do too much at one time. So yeah. at some point I was just sitting and, you know, you're working 50 hours or 60 hours a week and you're like, what am I doing? And I finally said, I have to be really good at one thing. And that's building office condominiums and developing. And I got to let go of these things that I'm trying to, to build because it's just not working. So that was a fail for me. I shut those two businesses down and just focused on the condos. Um, but it took me a while to, to just sit back and say, all right, this isn't working. I'm exhausted. And this is at this business, the security business is average and the other business is average. I want one business to be really good. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. I am back again here on the King stage. I've got Jeff Sawyer here with me. Jeff, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Yeah, you know, uh, we were just uh, talking offline, uh, low key, how how you're just a, an intense physical dude. Uh, and so I'm going to get into that some of that here in a second. But you were you were uh, doing some coaching and some uh, some cheerleading for one of your family members doing an Ironman, and uh, you got a little history with that. Not only on top of that, you're a successful business owner, so this is going to be an intense conversation. I'm an intense dude, though. I think my audience is as well. I can't wait. Jeff, tell us what kind of business that you got. So we are a uh, located in Connecticut, about the center of the state. Uh, we are a remodeling business. Probably about 90% of our business is remodeling, 90% uh, of that being uh, residential, 10% commercial. And then we are also developers. We developed an office condominium kind of concept, and we're currently building uh, an uh, 18 office condo complex uh, in a town close to ours. So we do, we do two different types of uh, construction. Love that. You say the middle of Connecticut as if Connecticut's this ginormous yeah. place. And we, <laughs> it's one of the smaller ones, but yeah, yeah, so was, yeah. We're, we're centered right around the capital of Hartford and we do about yeah. an hour. Our, our radius, our reach is about an hour from that. That's point. cool. Well, not for, much further than that. You start getting into uh, quite a few other States. Um, but I'm yeah. familiar with Hartford. I, I, I flew into Hartford, um, April of 2012, I was 24 years old. Actually, I take that back. I had just turned 25 and um, I was there for Edible Arrangements University oh, there in okay. Wallingford, Connecticut. Yep. <laughs> it's down near the shore. Yep. That's yeah. About, yeah. They've uh, since, they've, they've since moved to Atlanta, but, uh, but I, I love the area. Connecticut's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, we, we, we joke around that it's the connection between Boston and New York. So people just yeah. pass. But Connecticut's got some nice things too. But the, the yeah. best part about living in New England is strictly the fact that we can get to so many states uh, yeah. in short time. I can be in Vermont or New Hampshire in a two hours. So uh, yeah. the flexibility of Connecticut being in the center is probably the benefit of the most be beneficial part of living in this state. Yeah. Yeah. You can get a train down into the city. I, I didn't yeah. do the train, but I took a I flew specifically into LaGuardia and rented a car and drove it to Connecticut so that I could go hit the Peter Luger Steakhouse in Brooklyn. There you go. Uh, on the way to uh, freaking Edible Arrangements University. So many, it feels like decades ago. But um, okay, Jeff, <clears throat> you're doing this construction thing. You got commercial, you got residential, you're a little bit of development. Um, we haven't gotten into your your low key, which you told me before, <laughs> before we hit the record button that you've done multiple Ironmans. But <clears throat> what's what's inside of you? What's ticking on the inside, this burning thing um, that just keeps you going? What is it? You know, it's always been something I've had I, I, as, a, as a young kid. It was something that I, uh, you know, I wasn't the most athletic, uh, but I was, I would outwork you. And it was just, I was a hustler. And I've taken that as a kid and kind of moved it into my, my, my business life is I'll just, I'll simply outwork you. And, I, and, and whether that's lifting weights or, or doing anything physical or business, it's just a mindset that I've always had in me. I joke with people and I'll say, people, I don't drink coffee. People will say, how do you wake up? And I just, I jokingly say, my passion wakes me up. And so, the, you know, that's just something I've always been driven by, just having passion for whatever you're doing, making sure the thing that you are focusing on is you're putting your full attention to it. And that's kind of how I've carried my, my personal life and my business life. Yeah. I mean, when I hear that, it, <clears throat> like, I want to break that down a little bit because at this level, it's like, I hear you, you're a freaking winner. But what the listener might hear is like this cliche, like, yeah, I'm passionate about what I do. Yeah. And this is like, just like a buzz thing. So for you specifically, this was, 
developed out of sports. It was developed from your family. Or like, where did this where did this get cultivated in you? Yeah, so my parents owned a Polish American bakery. My grandfather started the bakery coming over from Poland, and my wow. parents parents worked there. My father worked at night. My mom ran the store. So I saw how what hard work meant. You know, my yeah, parents literally. Be, at Christmas, you know, they'd be working twelve hours a, a day at that time, and so I learned how to work hard from my parents. My parents yeah. were hustlers, both of them. Uh, they neither went to college, um, and and you know they're super. My father's been super successful because of that. Just learning to work hard and hustle was the is what I grew up seeing, and that's just how I've always done things. Um, yeah. For the for the young guy or gal listening today, um, <clears throat> you know, just coming out of college, or maybe they haven't even gone to college, but they're listening and. Um, and they're like, okay, yeah, I get the grit thing, right? Because the 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 newer buzzwords aren't just the grit, but it like you know, um, enjoy life and follow your passions, and yeah. and working harder isn't always working smarter. And so, and and look, <laughs> I don't, I haven't built multiple companies in different industries not working smarter, okay? But I guess what I'm trying to ask you about is you've seen not only your parents, but then now you've done it, and you kind of get what I'm saying about the younger generation. What would you say to that person about like maybe this this balance of working harder versus smarter? Because the harder doesn't just go away. No, it stays with you. Then look, I ultimately it took me it took me to my forties to realize you have to have a balance in life. Whether it's it's work, you know, it, up until forty, I was just working way too much, and so I, at something clicked in my forties to said I have to have a balance. I have to have my off life, and it's hard when you're an entrepreneur. You just want to constantly yeah. work. But you yeah. have to take time for yourself. Um, ultimately, you'll you'll carve out you know a life of uh, leisure and 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 business, and try to figure out a way to set it up the business to, that you can take time away from it, and the business will still run. And that's a cha- right. super hard to do, especially when you're first starting. That to 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 let go of some of those things, whether you're hiring people, and that was some of the lessons that I learned. You know, we we always tried uh, me and my business partner, we would try to do everything ourselves. And we finally looked at each other at one point and said, okay, we're, we're our quality of what we're producing as just people is not what it should be. What do we need to do to make it better? Let's hire an estimator. That was like our first step. It was just me and my business partner. We hired an estimator. It took so much weight off of us having someone else to do just that little piece of the business. And we started to, to started to see when we get to the point where we're overwhelmed and our, our work is suffering, then we need to bring someone in to help. And it's okay to have other people around you to help because it frees you up to do yeah. what you love to do in the business. And it also frees you up to step away from the business when you have the time because it'll still it'll still operate without yeah. you being there. And that's one of the hardest lessons for me as an entrepreneur that because you want to do everything. You want your hand in everything. You just sometimes have to let go and you'll learn that. And once you learn that, it, I think it's a, it's a game changer for, for your quality of life and your business. Cause yeah. you're going to, you have some other people coming doing these little things that you you're scrambling to do. Now you can focus on building the business, better customer relations, better processes, better quality. Um, but it was one of my hardest lessons to learn is to let other people help. Yeah. Yeah. I want to dive into that <clears throat> here in a second. We've, um, and, and also the, your reference of basically maturing and, and finding a balance. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get to that here in a second on the show. I, I love, I love that, that conversation because you're hundred percent right. Sometimes it takes perspective change. Um, and for us to realize the stages that we're going through, because to our point initially is that hard work doesn't go away. You can't just all of a sudden get to where you want to go without really a little hard work. Um, or sometimes a lot of hard work. It, it you know, depending upon what you're working on, I guess. But um, there's there's stages of where that hard work gets applied, and so we we can get into some of that as well. Um, for you, give us a little background. Like, have you always been in construction, or did would you start this company with this partner thinking I'm gonna I'm gonna change the world? Like, why why what were you doing before, and why construction? Yeah. So my 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 ex- you know, childhood was Legos. And I don't know if anyone, the younger listeners, but Legos and Lincoln logs. Yeah. Legos uh, have made and, a comeback, dude. Like my drawing. kids right now. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You don't want to yeah. step on them though. Right. Those are the, that's the worst part. <laughs> but the, for the me, that was, that was kind of my, my, as a kid, just building things out of Legos or Lincoln logs or, and even draw sketching. Cause I ended up going to school for architecture and 
that's where some of that foundation started. It was just what I loved to do as a kid. And I kind of carried that through, you know, I, I worked in high school uh, doing construction. So I had the hands-on experience. I decided to go to school for architecture. So I learned a little bit the other side of that. So yeah. it's just kind of always been in my blood. My father, as a, you know, when I was growing up, had a workshop in the basement. I would build, you know, I would build a go-kart out of wood or we would build gifts for my mom or my, you know, family, you know, what, what, whatever it was, we were in that workshop constantly working with our hands and wood. And my, I just watched my father and he did, was handyman and he did all that stuff. So I just loved it. It was something I enjoyed when I was a kid, but I still enjoy it. I have a workshop in my house. It's, it's, it's very relaxing for me to go down and build something. So I think it started there when I was a kid and, and it's kind of just, it's been in construction has been in my life and it's something, yeah. you know, there's times it's a grind just like anything, but in general, it's, it's amazing that you can take something and transform it and you get to see the finished product. You can walk into someone's house. You can see their excitement when you put it, do a new kitchen or an addition and just see how happy they are with the final product. And that to yeah. me is what it's all, you know, what it's all worth. It's all worth for, because when you see people smile and they love your work to me, that's, that's the, yeah. that's the special sauce. It doesn't, you know, we all want to make money, right. And that's our goal, but that is our biggest driving force is our customer relations because it's the most important piece of our business. Yeah. You're talking about, you know, <clears throat> almost like two, um, intrinsic value pieces there. Number one of building something and finding, value in what you did and taking raw material and putting something beautiful together. And then the appreciation of the customer looking at that and going, wow, I can't, can't believe you did that. Or this is beautiful. Or then now knowing that they're going to be happy with that space for you know years or maybe even decades to come. Like, why do you think that port, that part for you or for your team, it resonates so high? Why, why, why is it not so much the, it's not that you're not growth oriented, um, but why is that higher? I guess is what I'm saying, where you're focused on this end piece of, wow, look what I built. And then on top of that, them going, whoa, this is incredible. My home is beautiful now. What, why is that so important? So, you know, it, it, it's kind of evolved over the years, um, especially with, with True North is when we started this business, we, one of the things I, I'm a big believer in reading, reading uh, personal books, business books, everything. I read a ton. Yeah. And in fact, uh, you, you, most of your listeners, my, I make my guys have a book club. So we have a book club at True North every other Love Thursday. It. We read a portion of whatever book we decide to, to do. Um, yeah. But in the beginning, when we formed the business, we read a book um, by Simon Sinek, Find Your Why. Um, yeah. And that was a game changer for me and my business partner. We sat in a conference room. We would talk about the book. You know, it's just in the first couple months of when we started. What is our why? We're trying to figure it out. You know, everyone's why is, yeah, I want to make money and be successful. But we both at the same time came and said, relationships, I feel like our relationships and that was what our why is. It's like building great relationships. And that goes to our customers and that goes from our, our trades, uh, our suppliers, you know, yeah. anyone that's in our circle of influence, it's a, you build those relationships and that, that, that blew up our business because of that. Um, yeah. So, you know, we went, why, why is that so important to me and my business partner? And it's because we, we played Little League. We played sports. Like I think sports are a big part of people's lives because you learn how to be in a team and, and have that team atmosphere. And that's what we wanted to build at True North for all our guys. They, it, you know, everyone says family, but we really wanted to have a strong team and build great yeah. relationships. You know, we try to cultivate that. We do things where we take our guys on a fishing trip, but I also bring my electricians and I bring my suppliers so they can sit in yeah. non in a non-working setting and have some fun. And you'll, you'll get some business talk and you'll maybe solve some of some of these issues that happen on the field. Like, Hey, if you did this, you, you know, this would work out better. Yeah. Um, so we try to interact in social events, our, 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 our employees and our trades in our, in any suppliers, because it, yeah. I think it just cultivated a, a teamwork that we're all on the same team here. Um, yeah. We do a company hike every year. I, I make our guys hike a, a mountain in New Hampshire. Not a big one, 3,200 feet, but it's, it's yeah. just the whole experience of the day, um, yeah. being together and spending time like that. So we try to do a lot of those team building events because yeah. I, it's it's building our internal relationships, you know, and then those will 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 manifest out to the other relationships like our customers. 
I, yeah. the, the most exciting thing I, I find when I go out at the end of the job and to, to meet with a customer to go over um, the final uh, walkthrough with them is the, they just rave about our people. And that to me is great. Like we've created a culture that that's, yeah. they just rave about our guys. And that's, that's what, that's, what, that's what, that's what we started the business for. And that was our why. And so back to the book is that's really, we've taken, figured out our why and that has gone across all of our channels of whether it's social media, whether it's our customers and our, um, and our suppliers. And, and so the relationship piece is always there and it's helped really grow our business because people see that and they feel that when we're out working at their jobs. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> again, it's one of those really, really important things, um, that maybe the listeners heard people talk about how relationships are more important than money. Um, almost, you know, one of those cliche things that, you know, it's tough to execute on. How do you, how do you execute? Well, you've just given us really several examples there, not only internally, but also externally to your, you know, the folks that are, uh, you know, f- I guess front facing customers and, and vendors even, and even, but <clears throat> a lot of super practicals there. What I, what I got even inside of your practicals was that, and maybe it's industry specific, maybe it's not, maybe it's just the guys that you're pulling together. But if you've got a, if you've got folks that are, busy. They, they want to be busy with their hands. They're building everything on a, on a regular daily basis. They're on, they're on the job sites. It probably makes sense to have a company meeting while hiking or something similar. Um, and we did something uh, like this actually recently with, with our mastermind group. Um, you know, we've got high performing seven to nine figure business owners. These guys are achievement guys. They're the ones running the meetings in their companies. <laughs> right. Right. It's like, how do you, how do you get a bunch of uh, high achievers to, to have a discussion? Well, it's typically around something physical. <laughs> and so whether it's a hike or whether it's, you know, a, a campfire or, or whatever, um, a lot of those things can really, I guess, bring the atmosphere is what I heard you saying. You were curating the atmosphere so that individual conversations, whether it be on your team or whether it be through your team members and the vendors, a lot of those things can just flow naturally if an environment is curated in a proper way. Would you agree with this? Exactly. A hundred percent. And that's, you know, there's always motivation behind that. It's to get the team building. But when you got to, uh, you got these, all these different people that you're trying to, to get to finish a project and they're sitting and, ha- and they're fishing off the ocean, you know, out on a boat fishing, those conversations, like you said, are going to come up naturally. And, and it's just, it creates a different feeling when you're on the job. Like, you know, the, the electrician's probably going to go, he's standing next to the, the plumber when he's fishing he's going to have a conversation with him. So the next time the electrician's out there wiring something, he's going to think in his head, oh, I I remember what the plumber said about, hey, can you do this a little different and it won't interfere with what I'm doing. So you're creating all these conversations and and processes. Synergy. Without even really knowing you're doing it. And it's to me, it's the most important thing. I mean, everyone laughed at me when I wanted to bring a book club in and have (laughs) all these guys read books. We actually did a funny video on it um, on our social media. Um, But they hemmed and hawed in the beginning um, because I learned this at a previous company that I was at that we did a book club. And, you know, we have some great conversations on some of the stuff. We read a Jocko book. Um, yeah. and people got into it. They enjoyed it. And I, you know, you'd sit back and watch everyone talk about it. It was, you know, it's only 20 minutes on a, on a, during a meeting, but people, people use that language from those books and they talk about it outside of the book club. And so yeah. look, if you can have one person influenced by reading something, a book or something, I think to me, that's, it's so worth yeah. it. Yeah. I got two things here for the listener. You're just giving <clears throat> so much good stuff right here. I got to, I got to make sure that they're, that they're getting it. Number one is the curation of this environment that we were just talking about. And the example that you gave of the electrician and the plumber, or it's just two people on your team. Um, when you humanize a relationship, right. And it's not just this person that I work with or the guy that comes in after me, after I'm done with my portion and then he comes in and does his portion. When you humanize them, where you have real conversations and you learn about their family and you learn what kind of, you know, what kind of drink they like or what, what food that they don't like because you're all going through the food line together or whatever. When this person becomes real, it's like in the moment of frustration on the job site or whatever company you have as a listener right now, all that goes away because it's like this guy's a real person and I know possibly the name of his wife and kids. And I know that he doesn't like ketchup and just weird stuff that you don't get unless you're in a curated environment like that. And, uh, and everything changes from that because I want to honor this person because they're real. Exactly. Huge. Like I just cannot, (laughs) like if, if we ended the podcast right now, my goodness, that would be enough. 
The second thing you said, though, around the book is that I heard you say, as a leader, you ran through the door of, I know my guys are going to laugh. I know they're going to, like, it's going to be a little bit like a grind in the wheel to kind of get the book club going. And and even the name book club is a little bit <laughs> cliche and funny. Yeah. But, but once you press past that as a leader, because we both know the impacts of the book and of the impact of doing the book together as a team, they don't. And so it's like they're guarded. That's like, this is what natural people do to personal development, to really team building. Like these are just things. And so we just kind of push ourselves away or push, you know, the, the, the compounding effect away. But you press through all that. And then once you break through the wall, then it's like, they love it. Would you? Yeah. They the second this? Exact, yeah. Oh, I got a ton of pushback. Like, the, you know, they were making <laughs> jokes and, um, we, and, and, and like I said, we did a video on it and people were candid and then, but it, within that beginning of that video, by the end of the video, they all loved the book club. So they started yeah. out, you know, it's a little uncomfortable. You got to get people out of their comfort zone ultimately. Right. And then, and when you get yeah. people talking about you know, whether it's a sensitive issue or, or how you communicate or those type of things, um, once you push past that, people are going to open up more. And it's not only just for business, but, you know, I might go home, they might go home to their wife or their spouse or their partner and it reading a book about communication or something that has to do with business that might change a little bit of that relationship back home. Maybe it's with yeah. your kids. And so you don't know how, how far that web of influence just by reading a book can, can put, go into other people's lives. And, yeah. and it, it creates the, the camaraderie too of, you know, we're doing this all together. It's not as corny as it sounds. It's actually, we're getting something from it. Um, and it, you know, I've had a couple of the guys come up to me when we were on the hike, say, Hey, you know, that last book we read was amazing. He's like, you know, I'll have one of the guys said, we're on the job site and you can hear guys talking about the book. Um, yeah. you know, wow. and, and I think that's, it's, that's the stuff that I get. I enjoy the feedback when I hear stuff like that, you're trying to build, do this stuff. You're, you're trying to lead and you're trying to throw some things yeah. against the wall to see if they work. And when you, yeah. when they do work, it's just, it's super fulfilling for me. I mean, that's the, that's the stuff I enjoy. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about as a leader, <clears throat> getting, getting the fulfillment of, of building other people. Right. And, and I think that that is a hundred percent right. Um, and, and I'm with you on that there there's a whole nother juice that we get from that even inside of the reading the books and and it changing the environment of the job site <clears throat> or a homeowner watching the funny video on your social media do you think as a listener right now do you think that the projects done by the team who's cohesively reading a leadership book by Jocko is going to be more well done or less well done do you think a homeowner watching a funny social media video of a team personally developing themselves and making themselves better people. You want that team coming to working on your project or, or not? Like, I just don't see any ways of losing in what you're doing. Um, I mean, have you gotten feedback on, on, on any of these things I've mentioned? Yeah. You know, it's funny when I tell customers, we do a book club, you know, everyone immediately is like construction guys sitting, you know, the image of all yeah. of us drinking tea and sitting and doing a book club and stuff, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's like, really? But our customers, when we tell people that they actually, they're like, wow, that's like a different level. Like, yeah, you yeah. guys aren't just a construction company. You're trying to build a culture and an environment. And I think through all of that stuff that we try to do on the outside of work, whether it's, you know, cultivating that team environment, we don't, I don't advertise to hire people. People, the last probably four guys that we've hired have come to us, whether they've seen our social media or they've heard about us through a vendor and they like the atmosphere that we've created. So people have come to us to want to work. And we've yeah. we just hired we we just hired a young kid. Um, we didn't we didn't need to hire anyone. And uh, my tile supplier said, "I think you this person would be a great fit for you. He has seen some of your stuff on Instagram. You should reach out to him." So we reached out, and we were so impressed with the kid. We we made a spot for him. Like so, it's just when you create this environment of of all these team events and just having a good culture, people will want to come work for you. It makes your life a lot easier trying to find good help and good people. Um, yeah. you know, and yeah. I would rather hire someone that's a good person and teach them skill set than the opposite, I, you know, versus someone that's super skilled and they just don't fit or they're not great people, you know, ultimately character wise, it's just, right it's better to start with a really good person because that's going to transcend in front of customers. It's going to transcend with the team. Um, yeah. So that's kind of our, been our philosophy on trying to grow this culture, you know, yeah. there's multiple Love reasons it. to do it. 
Yeah, you're <clears throat> you're hitting, like you said, multiple uh, reasons or, or just even layers of your business are being affected because you're pressing into the importance of people, but also the, the building of them. Um, I, I want you to go practical here. Not that we haven't been practical, but because um, I think we have actually been really practical. I want you to tell me in um, the first couple of years of your business, what was something that you did um, that you can look back on and go, mm, that was a really good decision. And it helped me get to where I am today from like a success perspective or a, like I would, re I would repeat this decision. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. We started the business, uh, me and my business partner, I'm 10 years, 10 to 12 years older than he is. Uh, I have more of a corporate background, work for big home builders, um, you know, different, he, he's a carpenter. So we, we had a different level of skill set. When we started the business, we wanted to, to be equal 50, 50. Um, and I think we struggled in the first year to year and a half because we were both going on the sales calls. We were both doing estimates. We were, we were both running projects. Um, yeah. and it just started to drain us that we were doing so much. And then I, we just sat in a room and we just kind of had an argument about the business, which you, you're going to have arguments, right? It's just part of yeah. it. I had never had a business partner and I've only known Matt, my Matt powers, my business partner for a, maybe a year, year and a half before we joined forces. So it was all wow. new. The whole thing was new. And we had this argument about this just doesn't feel like it's working. And oddly, I was, it was on a Friday. I was going on vacation for a week on a leaving Saturday. I went on vacation, sat on the beach and said, all right, I need to be the leader ultimately because I have more experience and I need to be the leader of the business and to let everything fall into place. And that was a, that was the hard struggle because we were trying to be 50, 50 and we're still 50, 50 partners, but I've decided sitting on that beach said, what can I do to make his life easier? And what can I do to make the business better? So we decided simply, I'm going to handle all the customer service stuff up front. I'm going to do all the sales. I'm going to run the business manage all the social media, manage the estimator. He's going to manage all the projects, all our guys, material ordering. So we kind of divide it. I don't go, I do all the sales. I go on the calls by myself. Now, once we decided that it's changed, the, it changed the game for us because we defined yeah. our roles. We're not stepping on each other's toes. We're not doing, you know, multiple things the same. So there, he has his responsibilities. I have mine. And that to me, was a game changer in our business. Once we self-identified some of the areas that we could improve, it changed. Yep. It changed. It changed our, our projection in terms of, uh, you know, with our business growth. We started out with just me and him. We have now 15 employees. We we started in 2017, so it's been on, you know, six, it'll be six years, and we went from two employees to 15. Um, and that moment of us dividing. The, and conquering instead of trying to be equals changed everything. Um, yeah. in personally, I, I had to, um, you know, I had to lead, I had to, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't want to step on his toes, but I knew I had more experience with setting up businesses in corporate, uh, cause I had done this before worked in the corporate environment. So I kind of just yeah. had to push forward and be the leader that they needed me to be. And I feel like that, you know, it, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I feel like that's really was a turning point for us that we kind of just settled into those things, but it yeah. takes some time uh, to step back, especially if you have a business partner and really take a, take, take, pay attention to how you're feeling and what's happening, what's working, what's not. And you have to yeah. make some changes, but that's, that was our, our pivot point in our business. That, that simple coming back from vacation and changing the way I was going to function, which made him change hit the way he functioned. And it's worked out great since. Yeah. What I didn't hear you say was that <clears throat> you arrogantly came back to the business and said, well, <clears throat> it's mine. And uh, so here's what we're doing. Um, what I heard you say was I thought about it. I put thought towards what my experience was. I put thought towards how we work together and I decided to step up. And, and sometimes as leaders, um, you can have a partnership I, I, in my remodeling company here in Kansas City. Um, there's three partners and I'm by far the most experienced. But I can't be in the day to day. In fact, I'm not in the day to day. I'm on a weekly call. So how is it that I can interject experience without leading the day to day? Well, it's a different format than what you just said. So the regardless, it doesn't matter what you said that makes the difference is knowing the role. So in this case, I'm highly more experienced than my partners, but I can't be in the day to day. So 
his role, his role, my role are defined just like you said, which is so genius that you were even able to do that on your own without reading a, a book like Traction or something, which is you know where most entrepreneurs get their information from today. I read that book. That might have helped. <laughs> yeah, but but you figured it out first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I mean, and some of that's probably your experience just in, in the corporate side of things and seeing how things operated at a bigger level. But there was still humility is what I'm pointing out to the listeners that, that Jeff had humility to go, I need to lead. And that, that might sound backwards, like humility to lead. It's like, no, no, no. He needed to be the leader that the company needed, which doesn't mean you come in and beat your chest and dominate. It just means that you come in and you put the, the right pieces in the place. Very similar to where even though I'm not in the day-to-day like you are <clears throat> or running the, the, the pieces of it, I had to be the leader that was necessary, which is I had to put the pieces in place. And it looks completely different, our setup, our model. But we both were the leader that our business needed. How did you, how did like, what, what in that moment or, like gave you the gumption that he was going to follow you, that everything was going to be okay? Like, that could have maybe disrupted the partnership, maybe. I mean, were yeah. any of these thoughts in your mind? Hey, kings and queens, Chaz Wolf. I want to talk to you about something that's super important to me. We put a lot of time and effort, we meaning myself and my team, into this podcast, into the content that goes out every single day. And if you have been getting any sort of value or insight from this, we want it to be able to reach other business owners too. So we would love if you would like, comment, share, leave a review, post, share again. <laughs> All of the things on social media, on all the different platforms, or even on the podcast mediums of Apple and Spotify. We would love to be able to get our content into more hands, more entrepreneurs, so they can grow their business as quick as possible. Together, we are building a community of like-minded entrepreneurs who are committed to growing their businesses to new heights. So let's do this. Let's help each other. Let's help each other grow. Yeah, so it was funny because I still love to manage projects and and. I'm yeah. really good at managing projects. Um, and that's kind of, I'm, I'm someone that is super organized. So for me to give that up was a big deal. A, one of those things to say, all right, well, I could probably do a better job at if I take the sales part of it, cause I can be the upfront person. It was hard for me to step back from that. And it's taken me, you know, it took me the first six months to not like over looking over his shoulder and, and, but you know, we've set up processes so I can still see what's going on being involved. Um, yep. We get we I get weekly updates from our project managers and my business partner, so I can at least still see what's going on. Um, but that was a huge step for me to have to say, all right, I need to step back in this area so I can step up in this area. Because um, I'm I'm not someone that was a salesperson. That wasn't my thing. I was a you know I I can I never thought of myself as a salesperson. And so I maybe was a little hesitant to to get into that role. But once yeah. I kind of went all in on that role, it's just an easy fit for me. I can I I have the background of construction, I have architecture, I have design. So I it's a perfect fit for me because I can go meet at someone's house and look at a project or a kitchen and say, "Yeah, we can do this, this and this." And I think that's where we have a different edge. So I saw my value probably b- better in that front end of it than was was managing the projects because my yeah. business partner is good at managing projects. Um, so it's just a matter of identifying where you think you can make the business better and bigger or whatever your goals are and yeah. sticking to that and, and being humble to say, all right, yep. I, I love doing this part of it, but I'm not, I'm going to pass this on and let someone else do that. That And that goes back to hiring people. It's, it's a hard thing for entrepreneurs to yeah. let go of the control, but once you do, it's freeing. It really yeah. is. The business will be better for it. Yeah. Yeah, dude, you're, <clears throat> I'm glad we, we pressed a little further because the last little bit that you gave the, like the rest of the story, um, is the ending cap for the listener. So I hope the listener's paying attention because what you just said was, you know, you gave up things that you were good at so that you could be the leader that you needed to be in areas that weren't getting done properly. Cause if he's a craftsman, no way he's good at sales. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Which is fine. And he's, that means he needs to be over there. And that's what you were able to see as a leader is go, okay, like his craft is here. He can manage a project. So can I, but, but he can, I'm going to press in over here where maybe I'm not as comfortable. That's humility. That is like, let me take the low road. Let me figure this out over here so that together we can freaking win. Yeah. And that's, know, that's like, the game changer for us. It changed our whole, um, that moment in time changed our whole business.
it was either going to yeah. fail or or we were going to be successful and, and it's gone uh, above and beyond what we even thought um so it, it's yeah it's a it's a huge pivot point for us what about uh jeff a bad decision you know we've we've uh, kind of reminisced a little bit on something yeah. that was a game changer for you but <laughs> what was uh, not the greatest hour so let me think so uh, previous to this business, True North, um, I'll give an example of, uh, of a failure. I was running a development business. I was building these office con- condominium projects. And I started to say, let me figure out a way to capitalize on um, what I'm doing. So I set up a company to offer security monitoring to the my client office, you know, for the mm-hmm. office security. And then I said, well, why don't I manage the condo association so I can get that end of it. But it was just me. I was the only person in the business. And so I, what I quickly realized is I, I tried to do too much. I was trying to capitalize on too many things and I was average at them all and everything was suffering. So I really, like I just failed. Like the security thing failed. The property management thing just didn't work because I couldn't put the effort into it. And I was trying to do too much at one time. So yeah. at some point I was just sitting and, you know, you're working 50 hours or 60 hours a week and you're like, what am I doing? And I finally said, I have to be really good at one thing. And that's building office condominiums and developing. And I got to let go of these things that I'm trying to, to build because it's just not working. So that was a fail for me. I shut those two businesses down and just focused on the condos. Um, but it took me a while to, to just sit back and say, all right, this isn't working. I'm exhausted. And this is at this business, the security business is average and the other business is average. I want one business to be really good. And so that's, that was a fail that led to, you know, a win because once I self-identified that I can't do all the stuff that you want to do as an entrepreneur, it, it, it helps you focus. Um, cause everyone wants to, you know, you want to have reoccurring revenue and you want to build this and, you know, you want to be all these big things. And right. it, you just try too hard. And sometimes that's what makes you fail. And ultimately it was perfect for me because I scaled back and I, then I went on to be successful building office condominiums. So um, yeah. that would be probably one of my bigger fails in business um, that I can what, think. What's the value for the listener who's paying attention to what you're saying? You're saying, you know, go bigger in one thing as opposed to having a bunch of little things. Um, what's the value for them in the one bigger thing? Like, What's enticing about that or what has been the reward for you in comparison to the two or three things that we're producing, but not, not nearly enough. I got more satisfaction personally because I was able to give all my attention to one thing. So the quality of the work we were doing got better. The relationships with our customers got better because I wasn't being pulled in so many different directions. And that was for me, the the most important. I started to see, I had more personal time too, because I wasn't I didn't have all these other things going on. So it changed the quality of my life too, is just focusing on one thing and doing it really well. Um, I think, you know, part of both of those pieces where your personal life gets better and you see the, your business and the surrounding things that you're working on get better. I think that's, that's the most important part. And that, that was a game changer for me. And it, it helped me to identify going starting this new venture that we just, we have to stay focused on certain things. Like we really quickly, when we first came out of the gate, we were doing 50% commercial, 50% uh, residential remodeling. We just realized we were more efficient. We were better at it. We can make more money in the residential market. So we really scaled back, you know, the commercial side of it. And I don't, I do one or two commercial projects a year versus we were doing 50% of our work. So you, you identify these areas that you could, you know, you maybe have to lose a little on one side to get this other side to really flourish. And that, and that was another piece of this new business. That was that same concept of simplifying things, focusing on one piece of it and growing that. Um, and that's been the, that's, that's, you see it repeat as a business owner, you have these lessons that repeat. And if you pay yeah. attention to what you did in the previous lesson, you can carry that into the new, when you, when you're confronted with this decision, you can use that history of what decision you made to make this decision uh, better. I, I always jokingly, you talk about slogans. I always, one of my slogans is just do the, the next right thing. And I, that. that's a mentality. A, f- a friend of mine came up with that and I've used that. So what's the next right thing to do at this moment? And I knew at that point, all right, we got to just do residential and let's get rid of the commercial because we can really do well at the residential. And that's, that's, that, it, that changed our whole philosophy on, on our business part of it too, our goals. Yeah. 
Yeah, your focus. Okay, so you've got you've got somebody listening right now <clears throat> who's like you and I both were years ago and <laughs> has multiple things going on and and he's hearing you. She's hearing you say, "Well, the value is this." And you and I both know they're not really listening. <laughs> Cuz they're going to keep going doing their two or three things or like me, uh lots of things all at once. What is it going to take, do you think? Or what did it take for you? I mean, you kind of described it, but what is that that moment where it's like, ah, enough is enough, yeah. and I and I really got to dial in. What's it going to be? Or generally speaking, for the listener, do you think? Well, for me, it was. I remember I was sitting on the job site. It was like five o'clock on a Friday, and I had worked like sixty hours that week. And I was just, and I hadn't gone on vacation. Like I didn't. Like I, when you start out in business. I just all of a sudden realized like two or three years went by and I hadn't gone on a vacation, like it, a full vacation. And I would do these little weekend vacations and I just was sitting there like, I need to go on vacation. Like, and so how am I going to, I have to cultivate a life that has a good balance. And oddly, I get picked on all the time. Uh, I bought a timeshare down in the Caribbean. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm 50 now, but when I bought it, I was 40. Everyone was like timeshare. But yeah. you know what that did? That forced me to go on vacation once a year. It forced yeah. me that I got to use that week. And yeah. that was a huge game changer that I knew I had to go on vacation that week. And it changed my overall thought process on my balance of life, uh, you know, live and work. Um, yeah. And it was just that simple moment. Like I haven't been on vacation. All of a sudden you wake up and three years later, you haven't been on vacation. And it, yeah. you need that. You need that to recharge your en engines. You need that downtime. You need to step away from things. And that yeah. personally was a cha game changer in terms of uh, how my life has gone forward from the, that moment. Uh, still yeah. have the timeshare uh, um, and I love it, but it's just one of those awesome. things that forces you to go on vacation. And that was a yeah. personal and business changer for me. Yeah. The principle that you're talking about of putting things on the calendar uh, ahead of time, really, whether it's vacation, whether it's time with your wife or time with your kids or sorry, with your, uh, your, uh, your, your team members doing the book club is what I was trying to say. Um, <clears throat> like all of that is, it's like pulling us forward. Right. But, right. but it doesn't work unless we put it on the calendar. So for you, the commitment of buying the timeshare, I love that. Um, because I think a lot of people have different opinions on all different types of things, including that, but for you, it served you in the way of saying, Hey Jeff, uh, it's that time again <laughs> yep. Yep. and fine, whatever that takes, uh, for you, this, this is a perfect segue because I told you I wanted to come back to the, the conversation of balance. And I want you, you've used the word and I think we're in agreement here, but I want to tell you my perspective on the word balance. And I want you to, uh, either refute me or, or let's, let's wrestle this thing down for the listener because every entrepreneur that I've come across has this issue. And it is what the best thing I can articulate is that we are obsessive by nature, right? This is why we're successful. This is why we want to be in business. This is why we want to have three businesses as opposed to one, which is what we were just talking about is because we want more and and it's like it's like an addiction to success to winning to whatever. Like we all know what this feeling is. You're shaking your head, I'm shaking yep. my head, the listeners going, "Yep." Okay. What we haven't figured out. And so we call it balance. Like, "Oh, I need balance." Like, we haven't figured out how to obsess about our vacations or about our marriages or about our children or about our whatever, fill in the blank. Um, and so for you, I would argue that obsessing for you in vacations was going, I don't care what anybody else thinks about timeshares or what it costs. I'm going down on this thing because what it does for me is blank, right? It, it fills that piece that I need going all in. So rather than the, the word of balance per se, I, I really lean hard in the word of obsession. What, what are your thoughts on what I just said? I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, I mean, ultimately, you know, it's for, 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 Business purposes, I want, I set it up this way that I don't like even our guys, right? For instance, we will not work on the weekends. I don't know where yeah. construction has, the, our industry has come in and said, we're supposed to work on Saturdays and Sundays. So one of our strict rules when we set up for balance for our guys and us is we will not work on the weekends. We have to sometimes, but we try our best not to because it's yeah. tough. We know they're going home and they have a balance and I don't want to wake up on a Saturday and have to deal with, uh, you know, doing work. I want to be able to have a balance. So we yeah. set that up from the beginning, no work on the weekends. 
we're very clear to customers that this is the time you can communicate to us. This is how you can communicate to us. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're very clear up front and you'll still have customers, for instance, that'll get you a text on a Sunday morning. I'm very, I can be very uh, rigid and I'll fire back. Like you just woke me up. Can you please, if you want to reach out to me on the weekend, please do that via email. And I'm happy to answer to you on Monday, but setting up some of these boundaries help with the balance because people nowadays they'll be texting you 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. I'm just someone that puts my foot down and won't stand for it. And I'm just blatantly honest with them saying, Hey, this isn't how I operate. Please don't text me at 11 o'clock and wake me up, send me an email. So I think if you set up some boundaries, right, right from the beginning, I think that'll help cultivate a balance in life because, you know, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're always working, even when you're on vacation. But so when I went on, when I go on vacation, I wake up in the morning, I go through my emails real fast and then that's it. I don't look at it until the next morning. I set some parameters, some boundaries, that I have for myself that I'm not, when I'm on my downtime, it's my downtime. That's the most important part, but it's yeah. all about boundaries, right? It's yeah. setting up and um, so that's, that's, that's part of what helped cultivate our balance is setting up those boundaries. Yeah. yeah the boundaries come from you saying, Hey, this other thing is also important to me. Right. right. And so I, I think that's what I did for so long was like, of course, business was important to me. Like we, <laughs> we don't need to convince anybody on this podcast that business is important because we love it. We're just like, okay. Yeah. But <clears throat> if I'm also saying that recharging is important or that my health is important or that my marriage is important or fill in the blank, if I'm also saying it's important, then I should do the things for that thing that make it important, AKA scheduling, AKA making sure that other things, including the business, don't encroach on it, aka boundaries, like Jeff is talking about. Yeah, yeah, and I do that when I, I'm I'm a big fitness pers- person. I absolutely love fitness, so I schedule in in my calendar is my I work out on Monday, Thursdays with a personal trainer, and then in the mornings I don't go. I that's my time to work out, and I I block those off in my calendar, and that is a, I'm just rigid to that. I do not I do not change my workouts for anything. And because that's, I'm, I'm putting my physical health and my balance is equal as, as the business. And you have to do that stuff because you, all of a sudden you're going to wake up and you're like, Oh, a customer wants to see you at 7 AM and now I'm changing my workout. And then now I'm not going, now I'm not going to come home and work out at night. And so you, you got to create the boundaries of this business and stick to it. Um, and once you kind of do that, it just kind of falls into place. You know, those boundaries will help with the balance. Um, And you just slowly, as you get older and more successful, you just keep adding things, you know, eventually um, those, maybe that, uh, maybe your time frame shrinks down a little bit of what you're actually, uh, you know, dedicating to the work part of it. And that other balance gets a little bit bigger as you get older and more successful. Um, That's, that's kind of where we all want to be, right? Exactly. I mean, you've talked about creating a culture, building up people, obviously there's systems and process. We haven't really talked about that, but all along the journey that you're talking about uh, at a certain maturity, the business and you as the leader can operate differently. And because later in life, I have a desire to fill in the blank. Well, I've now afforded myself that, that, uh, that luxury or that, that capability because I've fill in the blank. Yep. Um, so I think all these things are, you know, in essence, a math equation. And, and, and that's what you just said about your, about your, uh, your calendar. I'm not, I'm not looking at my email so that I can change around my work out in the morning because my math equation for success is I work out in the morning like this so that I feel a certain way so that my mindset's a certain way so that when I show up to the actual customer meeting, I'm sharp and I win. Exactly. I got a question for you about like a business resource, a book, podcast, uh, something that you've paid to go to. What have you gotten value from that you can share with the audience? Well, it's funny. I uh, obviously I listen to your podcast. I think it's amazing. Um, I I appreciate that. Podcasts are, uh, to me, on a personal level or a business level. Um, I actually listen to Simon Sinek's pod- podcast. He does a um, he does one that's really short. It's like twenty five minutes, half hour, so you yeah. can hit them in between. But he's just got he covers everything from personal to business. Um, is one of my favorite. And then honestly, I I I'm a big reader, whether it's business or personal. Um, yeah. And this is probably, I bet you no one knows about this book, he, uh, this author. Um, it's, it, I don't know what it is about why books, but there's something that hits me. Um, there's a book called The, the Why Cafe. Um, okay. He has, 
He has a series of books. Uh, I'm going to kill his name. His name is John Strickley. Strickley. Um, okay. He's got a series of books and it's more, uh, they're fiction, but it's life lessons. And I've read that the Y cafe probably three different times. And every time I've read it, I've picked up something in depending on where I was in my life. Um, yeah. but he has a great series of books and some of the stuff in his books is business. And so you can actually pick up some of these different things. Like for instance, uh, one of his books, uh, is based on a company in Canada. That's a human resource company and it, it's off the charts with, uh, people wanting to work there. They, they developed a culture, even their office is set up in a system in a way that although it's all glass and you're looking out into nature and they have, uh, they have wow. gyms and they have uh, trails and they have, so the, he set up this incredible culture that people wanted to, there was, I think there was a restaurant and a bar at his office. And so people, <laughs> you know, he's sure. cultivating this culture. Um, and, and, and so I started to, you know, part of that book was we, we did this funny thing. It was called self peer, uh, peer reviews, right? So we created this, we did it for like a year. It was more fun than anything. We called it, um, you know, in our industry, you're milking it is kind of a, a term. So we created a, as a joke, the milkman of the month. And so we actually, <laughs> yeah, we actually would work every month. We'd get all our guys together in one of our meetings and we would just joke around. All right. Who we would vote almost like survivor style. Yeah. Who, who was the milkman of the month? Like who took, who took an extra vacation? And, and what we did is yep. you had to, we made a magnet of a milkman. You had to drive it, have it on your truck for, for that month. <laughs> <laughs> so it was fun. We had fun with it for about a year. And, but it was I, something I pulled from one of his books. Um, yeah. They had these peer reviews and I thought, let's just have some fun with it. So uh, his series, I think he's got four or five books is one of my favorite uh, suggestions for anyone in personal or in business to read his books. So that's awesome. Yeah. I think that, uh, well, first off, we'll put all those in the show notes, make it easy for the listener to find those. But um, you know, the little, the little secret that you didn't, you said it, but I don't know if the, the listener caught it is that you've read it three or you know maybe more times now. It's like, I've read hundreds of books. I'm mean, as yeah. I'm sure you have as a big reader, but <clears throat> I find myself going back to a few over and over. And the value of going over and over is that I'm growing. I know I'm growing. Yeah. And so every time I go back to that book, um, I'm going to get something different and I'm looking yeah. for something different. Actually. Uh, there's, there's intentionality in going deep on a few. I still love reading and listening to a lot of books. And so I'm never going to be not, uh, doing that probably similar to you. I'm, I'm a big information guy, but um, man, I've got the, got the, the rotation, if you will. Um, yeah. and I just over and over and over again, you're like, Oh, this was so good. Why have I waited so long to read it again? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many books that you can pull from. It might not be your industry, um, right. that you can pull ideas from. Um, I'm, yeah. um, I'm, uh, I'm reading one now that actually Simon Sinek is the, uh, I think he was the producer of, and it was about a restaurant in New York that was rated the number one restaurant in the world. Um, and it was, it was based on their service. Their food was amazing, but it was based on yeah. their service on what they yeah. would do for their customers. Like you would walk in, they would know your name before you even walked in the door, like that kind of wow. customer service level. So I looked at that book and it said, that's the next book we're going to read in book club, by the way. But I went and I said to our guys, what can we, you guys are out on the front the front lines. You're, you're, you're at the customer's house. You're listening to the conversations between the husband and wife, pay attention to those things. If there's someone that likes fishing or if there's a, you know, a wife that likes yoga, pay attention, come back to me with that knowledge. And when we give them a, we always give our customer thank you gifts yep. instead of giving them a, you know, it's traditional box of stuff. We go out and get them something that actually is something they had talked Meaningful. about. Yeah. And it, it's, it's a game changer versus just yeah. these generic, you know, gifts. And I picked that up out of, out of one of those books. So yeah. I'm always reading and, and it doesn't necessarily need to apply to your industry. You can pull different information from that. So, yeah. Yeah. Last here, piece for the listener here. He he's not just always reading. He's lying to you. He's always <laughs> reading and implementing because that's what yeah. he just said is like, I got it. And then I went and did it. I got it. And then I went and did it. And, and this was the result. And then I got it. And then I went and did it you can't just read. <laughs> yeah. You gotta do everything. Yeah. <laughs> gotta implement it. I got one last question here for you, Jeff. I want to know if you had a chance to reach back into time and whisper in the younger Jeff's ear, what would you tell him? Um, I would say, uh, to, to, to pay attention, stop every once in a while and turn around and look what you've done. Cause I think in a, as an entrepreneur, we tend to always look forward. What's the next thing? Mm -hmm. How can we get better? 
But every once in a while, you got to turn around and look at what you've done and what you've built as a business. Or, you know, for us, we can drive by some of the stuff we've done, the buildings, the projects. But I think you have to take time to look backwards and see how far you've come. Um, yeah. We're going through something right now at the office where I'm getting rid of some uh, old files. And I just happened to go start going through the boxes. And it was I was just sitting there saying, wow, if we come a long way with everything we do, whether it's how we do our proposals, our contracts, our estimates, our, our right. processes. So I, I'm a big believer in looking back because it's going to make it's going to make what you're doing now just you're going to be more passionate about it because of how far you've come. So that would be my main yeah. advice. Look back every once in a while and appreciate yeah. what you've done. Yeah, it's it again, you're just hitting all the really gushy stuff, but it's so impactful. Um, the phrase that we use uh, inside Gathering the Kings peer to peer mastermind is grateful, but not done. Yes. And the perspective of stopping along the way i'm a big elk hunter and so you stop at what you thought was the top <laughs> but it's just a false top and i'm sure with some of the runs and stuff that you've done it's like you know you come around the corner and it's like oh there's more right there's that always that forward thinking you're talking about but yeah. it there is power what jeff's given to you guys right now in just for a half second taking back and, and even though it's a false top it's not the actual top you look back and it's still a, an, an amazing view um, and being able to specifically, you know, look at the things you've accomplished, uh, reach into that, that, uh, that treasure chest, if you will. But the view itself um, of just being okay with just for a minute, like, it's okay. We're going to, we're going to keep going. The top's still that way. Yep. We're on our way. Uh, but for, for just a minute here, we're going to just take in a deep breath on what we've done. We're grateful, um, yeah. but not done. So Jeff, uh, how can the listener find you? Number one, if they're in the Northeast, if they're in Connecticut within an hour of the center of the state yep. and, uh, and they need a beautiful remodel or they know somebody, one of their family members, how can they find you? Or if they're just an entrepreneur and they want to connect with you, how can they find you that way? We're on Facebook, uh, true north construction.com. Uh, we make it hard for everyone there's no E on true. So it's just true north remodeling. I mean, true north construction. We're on, that's our website, our Facebook, our Instagram, uh, you can find me on there. Anything that's uh, on my email, my cell phones are all on there. If someone wanted to have a conversation, I would love to talk about it. Um, but Perfect. that's where to find us. And check out our Facebook page and our social media. Uh, we do some fun, fun videos, with, but also with some serious stuff. And so um, people get to see our, our guys' personalities and get to see us as a, you know humans. And I think the, that's, yeah. that's important for us to do. But that's the best way to reach me if you're interested. Love it. Love it. Well, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I think that uh, we could probably keep this conversation rolling, especially on books and a book club. Man, yeah. you're talking my language. Uh, but I appreciate you being here. Uh, we wish you nothing but blessing uh, to your team members and all the cool things that you're doing inside your business and your community. Uh, thank you for being here, Jeff. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1,000 kings, specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.